Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Dave's birthday is this week. Is it Friday? Friday. Dave will be 15 years old. And like any dad, I still remember him being born. And uh, sitting there in the hospital. And uh, Dave, I got to stay there that whole night. And they didn't even make me put him in the incubator. I just held him all night. That was wonderful. Uh, he actually liked me for the first year of his life. Then we eventually figured out mom's better. We all do that. Same with the grandkids. They always like you at first, and then, and then it just got better. And that's just the way life is. Um, so that's uh, our big announcement. Our bishop is coming on September the 17th. So we'll have one service. We won't have a brief service that week, but we will have it on the first, second, and fourth Sunday of September. Um, we are only going to be at the, um, what do you call it, the uh, Summer Beach Festival in a few more weeks. So don't bring any more water, unless you just want me to drink water. And that's fine, too. I'll drink it, but we have two more weeks to give water away, and we'll be opposed to those uh, to encourage people to come down. Uh, Having a couple of nice conversations, one of which, someone who uh, occasionally attends our morning service, uh, his father is in North Jersey in the hospital. He's 100 years old. And so we'll remember, he actually, he lives over near you. Yeah, but you probably know him. Uh, what's his name, Chuck? Chuck? Uh, he walks by my corner all the time, him and his wife. His wife walks the dog by my corner all the time. So they only live about a block or two away from you anyway. Uh, his dad's 100 years old and he's up there in the hospital, so we will pray for him this morning. Is it the bulletin up there, by the way, Steve? The bulletin up there says it's good. Ed, no, oh, this one says it's right here. Ed is his name. Good morning. And uh, so we'll get to meet uh, Bishop Bill Jenkins, who is a wonderful man I've known him for many, many years. Uh, he'll Hopefully be here for Sunday school. I have to coordinate that with him. Uh, so that would be at 10. And then uh, we'll get to meet him afterwards at the luncheon. So uh, I would encourage you all to be there for that. Um, I guess that's all the announcements I have. So we will begin our worship on the cover of your bulletin. It's our call to worship. Oh, send out your light and your truth that they may lead me. Our opening hymn is number six. I sing the almighty power of God.
continue in our bulletin. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open. All desires known and from you and secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. We may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. Let us pray, O oh God, who declares your almighty power, teaching and showing mercy and faith. Mercy we grant us as a measure of your grace, that we, running the way of your commandments, may obtain your gracious promises, and be made partakers of your heavenly treasure. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Together. O Lord God of infinite mercy, we humbly beg you to look down with pity upon the nations now engaged in war. Look in compassion on those immediately exposed to the peril, conflict, sickness, and death. Comfort the prisoners, relieve the suffering of the wounded, and show mercy to Zion. And tenderly guard those who have been held here, their deprivations are sought. The move of your good God has lost all sense of the cages of the war. And of your great goodness is your peace among the nations. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our epistle lesson this morning is taken from St. Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians, chapter 15, beginning with the first verse. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. For I delivered to you, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to the other apostles, Last of all, as the one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believe. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke, chapter 16, beginning with the first verse. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. 
And the tax collector standing far off could not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. This is the gospel of the Lord. chapters that kind of go against the grain. Uh, not that they, they have to, but when we think of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we kind of isolate that. That is the love chapter. And uh, that you'll hear very commonly in weddings. Uh, love is patient, love is kind. There are three things which last, faith, hope, and love. So you probably heard that in chapter 15. Now, chapter 15 is the resurrection chapter. Now, it is probably written to scold the Corinthians, but there is so much encouragement in it that we can kind of miss the scolding. And there is, this is one of those chapters where there are some nuggets hidden in this chapter when you start to look at the context of what's being written uh, me being, I guess, a history nerd and loving grammar. I know that sounds really weird, but it's the words don't normally go together. Uh, there is some really neat stuff that we can find in here that gives us an amazing assurance to our faith. Normally, when we look at this chapter, we'll, we'll begin after the portion that we read. The first 11 verses, you might say, are kind of the preamble. Uh, we usually begin at verse 12, and especially verse 13. And that's Paul's admonition to the Corinthians, where he basically says, you know, if Jesus is not physically raised up from the dead, then your faith is absolutely useless. There's no reason for you to believe, and you might as well just go and be the worst pagan unbeliever you can because there's no difference because we'll all just end up dead 
Um, not the most encouraging thing, but that's what his point is. That's why we believe in the resurrection. And you might, beginning of verse 12, a theological argument of why the resurrection is important. Before that, in the first 11 chapters, we have what I guess you could say is a different type of argument. He's not beginning with theology. In fact, he begins, it's kind of like a 1950s movie. He begins with a song as he begins trying to teach them. You say, okay, where's the song? Well, you kind of see it laid out. I cheated a little bit uh, by putting it in there and setting it off. But this is quite possibly the oldest or the second oldest Christian song that we know of. Um, singing, though, has always been a part of the faith of the people of God. Um, singing to sing the Bible, singing to the Lord, but singing to catechize. And what is catechism? Catechism is basically teaching and instructing people in the faith, explaining the faith to others. Um, and it really doesn't matter if you're much of a singer now. Go read the book of Revelation. You'll find you'll be spending a lot of time singing in the future. So if you don't think you're that much of a singer, that's okay. Sing from your heart. Sing to the Lord. If you didn't know this, this is a nice fact. One third of your Bible is written as poetry. Meant to be sung. Now, not all of it is poetry that is just a hymn to the Lord. Some of it is poetry, which is instructional. And I was saying catechism. Uh, teaching people in the faith. Here's a trivia question, and I stumped everyone in the first service, and I'll see if I get you guys here too. It's a piece of catechism, which is why I bring this up. What is on the Billboard number one song of all time with the oldest lyrics? So, somebody guessed Jesus Loves Me in your first service, and no, that was never a number one song that I know of anyway. Uh, uh, a common guess would be Amazing Grace. And there was a version of Amazing Grace that was number one in England, except for the bagpipe version, and it didn't have any lyrics. But that was written in 1772. That might be a good guess. When I tell you the answer, you'll go, oh, of course. The answer, it was actually written about 3,000 3, years ago. It's that old. And it's a piece of catechism, meaning teaching people of how to live the, the life of a person of God, written by a man named King Solomon. And Solomon, in writing the book of Ecclesiastes, wrote a song, and it was copied in many times in the 50s and 60s, most famously in 1965 by a group called The Birds. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. Time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to heal. They added in some turn, turn, turns, which is the name of the song, and that probably brings all of that back to your memory. Uh, the point, though, is it's a song. Solomon wrote it as a song. Why was so much of this written as a song? There's two reasons. One, singing is probably the best way to memorize things. It's much better than just trying to read it off a piece of paper. But second, they didn't have paper for most of the history of the church. They didn't have books for most of the history of the church. People read a lot more than we give them credit for today, but for most of the history, if you wanted to know the Psalms, you memorized them, and you sang them back and forth to one another in order to recite them as praises to God. If you wanted to know a lot of portions of scripture, you had to memorize it, and it was often memorized by singing. This morning, we have like one of those hidden gems of the Bible, if I could call it. Paul talks about a poem, and I set it off in our reading as a poem, that was taught to him. And this poem was taught to him to explain what are the essentials of the Christian faith. And it was taught to him shortly after he was converted, as he was walking along the road to Damascus to kill 
Christians. Now, unfortunately, not all of your Bibles are actually going to set it apart as poetry, so sometimes it can be hard to notice when you're reading through your English Bibles. Why is this so neat? Well, honestly, there are many reasons. Um, it, for me, you know, it's neat because it's like the first, as I tell the term, the first Christian creed. Now, by creed, the word creed just simply means a statement of faith. The word credo in Latin means I believe. So it's the first statement that the Christians had in terms of what they believe. A summary of the faith when there were no Gospels written. So what do I believe about Jesus? Well, I can't look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're not written yet. I can't look at the epistles and reference them. They're not written yet. So they would memorize and teach each other these short little poems. Uh, there's a second one that's also famous, by the way. It's in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 11. That focuses on how Jesus is God. And basically, it's also a picture of our salvation. This one is about the resurrection and how important that is to our faith. So this first Christian creed should be for us an encouragement. Because one of the things it does, and this is, as you listen to people talk about the history of Christianity, you have so many people who really don't like Christ, don't like the Christian faith, who will speak against it and try to try to basically tell lies about the history. This tells us right here, that from the very beginning, in the midst of the most heated persecution of the church, when Paul was still named Saul, and he was still running around trying to kill Christians, this is what Christians told each other. This is what the core essential faith of being a Christian is. That Christ Jesus rose physically from the dead. Um, there are many, if, if you ever watch, and I don't recommend watching History Channel for documentaries on the history of the church, because they're always so wrong, and they'll talk about these different ideas about how Christianity has changed over the years. This kind of puts all that to rest. They'll say, you know, well, maybe for the first followers, you know, Jesus kind of rose spiritually or in their hearts. And it wasn't really until later on they had an idea of a physical resurrection. Um, and a lot of churches in the last 200 years have been doing that. And that's why they completely had to change their systems of belief. Because they don't have the true gospel anymore, so they've had to make up a brand new one. This passage written here, uh, Paul writes, first great things about the year 53 kind of points out that this has been the belief of the church from the very beginning, and that's what I want to show you. Uh, even prior to his coming to Corinth in the first place, before he left, before he writes them back. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'm going to walk through our lesson here. It begins with Paul reminding them that the gospel which he preached to them when they were still unbelievers, was that Christ died for our sins and that he rose from the dead. This is the gospel. And they can either stand in this gospel or their faith is in vain, meaning their faith isn't really in the gospel. So before he actually gets to the specifics of the gospel, he begins with this. For I deliver to you as of first importance, what I also received. So Paul reflects back. So if he's writing in 53, he's visited them several years before that, and he's received this faith several years before that. And before he gets to reflecting on this song, he tells us something about its source. He says, the faith that he is sharing with the Corinthians this isn't something that he's making up for himself. It's not about you know, how Paul 
feels about God or what his experiences with God are. What he would like God to be like, in other words. It's a faith which was given to him. And you can read about that. And when you read the book of Acts, when you read through Galatians, both of those have the story of Paul's conversion. He was called by Jesus, kind of different from the other apostles. All of them were called, of course, before the crucifixion and resurrection. Paul was called afterward, as he met him, Jesus met him on the road. He was also taught, according to Galatians, by Barnabas and Cephas. And that's another name for Peter. He mentions it here, too. Cephas is just a Greek word that means the rock, or rocky, or whoever you want to call it. Uh, we can be certain about our faith. <coughs> Because our faith is not simply something that we feel about God, or what we think. But we can know through his word, through his church, God has preserved and brought down that faith through time to us. Paul is kind of, you know, really referencing here. It's not something that can be changed by a bad meal. It's not something like with me. You know, I can preach a bad sermon, especially if I've had a bad night's sleep the night before. Maybe I didn't have enough coffee. Maybe I had too much coffee. Uh, cult leaders will preach not what is true, but what they think their hearers want to hear in order to try to grow larger audiences. It's not truth, usually. It's trying to say things which people like. And one of the things people don't like is certainty because people are uncertain about their faith. There's a lot of encouragement in knowing that we have a faith that doesn't depend on us. What does it depend on? Well, we look at the song. The song begins that Jesus Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. What are the scriptures? Well. We have one idea of the scriptures, but what Paul means here is talking about the Old Testament. Because, as I said, the New Testament hasn't been written yet. We can be certain that Jesus died, and that he died for my sins, because it was exactly the same way as God said it would happen. In the book of Psalms, in the book of Isaiah, and honestly, read Isaiah 53. Read Psalm 22, and there's no doubt you can see this is so clearly talking about Jesus. There's no way it could really be talking more about anyone else. Our faith is founded on the scriptures and how God keeps his word, which he promises in our scriptures. Paul then continues, and this probably sounds very familiar to all of us. Paul continues, and he says, and I'll paraphrase a little bit. And he was buried, and on the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. Where, where did I hear that recently? Yeah, that's right from the Nicene Creed. They just copy, paste, and put it right in the Creed, because this is the first Creed. Um, so, so far, what is the essentials of the Christian faith? Christ died. Christ died for my sins. Just the exact way God said he would die for my sins in the scriptures. And Jesus rose from the dead just exactly as God said he would rise from the dead. Where? Again, in the scriptures, in Isaiah, in the Psalms, in Daniel, in Job, in Hosea, all throughout the Old Testament. And one reason we can believe this, Paul is trying to point out, is that this is something that was believed by all Christians everywhere at all times, from the very beginning. This isn't Paul's theology. 
It's not something he made up. It, the point is, he says, this is the faith handed down to him. In verse 5, Paul moves in a different direction. And I'll, I'll use this to kind of switch to that second point. How we can take comfort in that truth. That the resurrection is the central core of the Christian faith. Paul says next, and he appeared to Cephas, Peter, and the twelve. And then he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Now think about that. He's verifying what he's saying based on people who, the Corinthians, they can go and talk to him. If I tell you, uh, you can believe what I said, because you can ask all these people, or as I used to be, uh, interviewed many people for jobs, and would get in resumes. Well, you, you put down a name and a phone number for me to call on your resume, and I call it, I can verify that. Well, they didn't have phones back then, but they could certainly verify it. They can go talk to Peter. Peter's still alive. Uh, Matthew's still alive. John is still alive for many years. It says, then he appeared to James. Now that's James, Jesus' brother, not to be confused with James the Apostle. Then to all of the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely of born, he appeared to me also. The reference to being untimely born uh, means it's, it's an odd expression. It's actually kind of a, a, an old expression, meaning someone who is premature born, a premature birth. But it refers to the fact that, as opposed to all the other apostles, he was uh, recruited to be an apostle after the resurrection rather than before. So Paul lists these witnesses to the resurrection. And, you know, if you have trouble believing that I'm telling you the truth, here are the witnesses. They saw it too. People still alive. People you can go, you can interview, you can find out their stories. Uh, there's a deeper point, I hope, you can see in all of this too. Remember, this poem or song is something that was taught to Paul when? Well, it was rehearsed by the early Christians, and it was something that he says was taught to him after his conversion, before he went to Corinth. Well, we kind of have some good dates for that interesting fact, and we, because we know the timeline of Paul's life, not just from the book of Acts, but there are other records of Paul and his journey and all the things that have happened in all these churches when the gospel came to each of these churches. Paul would have been converted about the year 37 when he would have met Jesus along the road. Meaning that this song was something that was popularly taught, believed, sung from one Christian to another as a statement of faith to encourage them in the faith. And the years, like two, three years after Jesus died and rose from the dead. The point being, it wasn't something that could have been added on later, because it was something that was solidly there, believed by every Christian everywhere from the very beginning. So yeah, I, I tried not to make it too heady today. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a history nerd, as you said, and, and I'm looking at the text, I'm like, oh, this is really exciting. It's Look, it's a poem, and it's kind of hidden here, but it's really there. But there's so much interesting encouragement we can take from the fact that we know that they believe the resurrection from the very beginning. This isn't something. And, and I say that because I listen to so many who have really destroyed the church by false teaching, by saying that, uh, you know, the resurrection wasn't necessarily physical. They, maybe they had a dream about it. Well, our hallucination one was one of the craziest ones. How do 500 people have the same hallucination at the same time? That doesn't make any sense at all. But they come with all these reasons why we shouldn't believe. Why? 
Well, here, it's a simple reason. We look out and we see death all around us all the time. Our bodies die. We have friends who have cancer. We have friends who are suffering from all kinds of diseases. And when we see death, it hurts us because it just strikes us. Nothing's going to stop this. Nothing can conquer death, right? So when Jesus conquers death, it goes completely against what we see in our everyday life. And it's the most wonderful, beautiful thing that we can see and know. It teaches us without this physical resurrection, there would be no Christianity. If the very first Christians didn't believe Jesus physically rose up from the dead, which means that we will one day rise up from the dead, the church would never have gone around anywhere. And that's why they were so courageous in their faith, going everywhere. And my favorite example is Lazarus. Someone wrote uh, in the 1930s this wonderful play called Lazarus Laugh. And he's being interviewed in front of the emperor Caligula, where Caligula is trying to tell him, Lazarus, you know, if you don't deny Jesus, I'm going to uh, execute you. And Lazarus just, <laughs> are you kidding me? And he says, no, I have the power to execute you, to send you to death, or to let you live. And Lazarus just keeps laughing in the face of Caligula. Because Lazarus, especially, all of them would know who has the power over life and death. Because Lazarus himself not only was raised, but he also saw the risen Christ. And he went around teaching the word world about the risen Christ, just as the other apostles did, just as Matthew, who was flayed alive in Ethiopia, and Thomas, who had a similar death over in India. They were fearless because they knew who had control over life and death. And they were fearless from the very beginning, not something that came up later. So that's our encouragement this morning. We can look and we can see in 1 Corinthians 15 this wonderful, beautiful, we could call it a golden nugget of truth that otherwise we wouldn't necessarily know. It shows us that the resurrection is the center point of our Christian faith. Let us thank the Lord who shows us the treasures in his word. And let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, the encouragement it brings. We thank you, Lord, for the hope of the resurrection that is in our hearts, that though in our lives we so often see death around us, and it can bring us such discouragement, though in our bodies we see them do nothing but fail, we know in your hands that you hold the power of life and death. We pray, Lord, we will trust in that. We trust in your word as it has been handed down to us in the scriptures. We trust in what we've heard preached this morning by Paul. Let your name be praised. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our reflective hymn is 26.
more blessed to give than to receive. But it's not the funeral worship, but the giving of his tithes and all.
Let us examine our hearts and humbly confess our sins to Almighty God, saying, Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge the need to mourn our many sins and wickedness, which we from time to time have previously have committed, by thought or every against your divine majesty, the promoting of the steps of your wrath and the indignation against us. We do our sins again, and are heartily sorry for these our many sins. Our members have been as a previous unto us, the burden of the hands of power. Have mercy upon us, have mercy upon us, most merciful God. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us for all our sins, and grant that we may never hereafter serve and please you in the means of our life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who with great mercy promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with hearty repentance and true faith turn to Him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what comfortable words our Savior Christ says unto all who truly turn to you. Come to me, all you who labor your heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son to the end that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Hear also what St. Paul says, this is a true saying and worthy of all men to be received. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Hear also what St. John says, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is very good, right, and our required duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, Everlasting God. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we praise and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Glory be to you, O Lord of this time. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We do not presume to come to this merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercy. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs from your table, but you are the same Lord, whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to meet the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be clean in our eyes. And our souls wash through the most precious blood, and we may have a dwelling well in him, and he in us. Amen. All glory be to you, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of your tender mercy has given your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made thereby as one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice offering and complete payment for the sins of the whole world, and that instituted in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of that his precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. Hear us, O merciful Father, and most humbly beg you, and grant that we, receiving these, your creatures of bread and wine, according to your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ's holy institution, and our members of his death and may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. When the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise,
our draft of supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as ye shall drink it, in remembrance of me. Amen. this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you.
us of all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Amen.